Ja, herzlich willkommen zur neuen Ausgabe SI Talk und das ist jetzt eigentlich so ein Überfallsinterview. Heute in der Früh habe ich noch nicht gewusst, dass ich das Interview machen werde. Ich bin durch einen Bekannten quasi auf diese Firma wieder draufgestoßen, durch einen Abonnenten eigentlich genauer gesagt und habe mir dann den Chart angeschaut und dachte, oh, uh, die Aktie ist eigentlich stark runtergekommen und eigentlich trifft es genau unser, unser Ziel. Und zwar, es geht um Wasserstoff, es geht auch um Öl und Gas und die Company deckt eigentlich beides ab. Ich habe mit der Company schon vor zwei Jahren, zwei Jahren äh, Interviews geführt. Es geht um Jericho Energy Ventures ähm, und die haben damals auch einen sehr interessanten Deal gehabt mit Prochladik, der Whisky Company äh, Firma. Äh, und ähm, ich habe mir dann den Newsflow eigentlich angeschaut und habe mir gedacht, eigentlich ganz gut. Und dann schaue ich mir den Chart an, der passt eigentlich irgendwie nicht dazu. Deswegen habe ich gedacht, da nutze ich die Chance, ich schreibe einfach den Brian kurz einmal an, ob er mir ja, Infos geben kann, wie es ausschaut. Und jetzt haben wir gleich gesagt, jetzt machen wir gleich noch ein Interview auch. Brian, thank you for your time. Uh, it's, I said in my German introduction, we do an interview uh, two years ago. Um, um, and you're working in the... In, in a very interesting area. One, you uh, work in the hydrogen, you work also in the oil and gas business. So both of them are very popular at the, at the moment. Oil and gas is popular, then uh, the, the, the companies make normally huge money, especially from the European view. You, you know, we have gas prices, sometimes they're going up to the roof. Uh, yeah. And, and, uh, uh, and uh, this morning, the Austrian uh, state oil company uh, reported a five billion profit and everybody is screaming yeah we must tax them extra that we get more money in 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 the, uh, oh on, in, in, on, in the public but the major shareholder of this company is the government so he get a lot of money from them so it's it's oil is very hot but hydrogen is hotter i must say um everybody is talking about hydrogen um and uh, i remember you do also a deal with uh, Bruchladik uh, two years ago uh on 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 the whiskey side and you have a boiler business and so on and uh when i look at, at your charts i was a little bit frustrating and um, also surprising that your chart is really yeah you're going down you build now a platform at 30 cents 32 cents around Uh, but uh, and you're stable there for the last six to nine months but um, you are in these hot areas oil and gas and uh, uh, hydrogen and your share price going like this so what is the reason why why uh, did the share market not react on your story it's a great question joe um i I, I wish I could, I wish I had a perfect answer for why the share market isn't, isn't as supportive as we think it should be, because the things we're doing are fairly unique. When we look at the things we're doing in hydrogen, we feel like we are really sort of blazing a new trail with the focus. I mean, we have a $30 billion dollar market that on thermal decarbonization that has no competitors right now. There's nobody focused on that space. And if you look at where we started to where we've gone with that, it's incredible. I mean, if you look at the press releases from Q4, we have 33 engineering studies, right? This is, this is 33 companies around the world that, had, that have engaged us to evaluate deploying our solution, right? Decarbonizing their thermal load in their one of their facility. And what is novel and what is exciting about it is these are not tiny facilities. These are folks that can deploy not one boiler, but can deploy hundreds of boilers around the world. Um, and so from our perspective, you know, the two things that have happened since those engagements are, you know, in, in the United States, you have the Inflation Reduction Act, which I'm not sure people appreciate the significance of the $3 per kilogram green hydrogen credit, but that makes hydrogen very cost competitive with natural gas. Um, if you think about it in gas terms, it's the equivalent of $22 per MMBTU of natural gas. So a huge move, like you're seeing people lean into that saying, okay, how do we take advantage of that? So for us, what we're starting to see is those engineering studies leading to people having new economic evaluations 
of what is the cost difference between hydrogen and their current fuel system. So really, really great opportunity now coming to fruition. Um, we have a great project that's part of the Halo Hub, which is one of the multi-billion dollar hubs in the state that are focused on delivering green hydrogen. So, you know, really good things on our hydrogen front. Um, pretty, pretty excited about where that is going. And our oil and gas assets had their best year um, possibly ever. Right. I mean, we've seen good cash flow from the oil and gas. And I guess from our perspective, we make the ultimate energy transition company. Right. If you think about what we're doing, we're taking the energy of today and using that cash flow to facilitate the development of tomorrow's energy, the green hydrogen. Right. So that's what all of the majors are doing. If you look at BP, if you look at Shell, you know, pick, pick your, your favorite major. They all have the same mindset. Use the cash flow from their oil and gas production. Obviously, theirs is significantly bigger than ours, but to fund the development of their green portfolio because the world is consuming quite a bit of oil and gas, but it is also going to decline. Um, today's fuel won't be tomorrow's fuel complex. And our vision is, is that the world needs every one of these energy molecules. Uh, we we are growing, populations are growing, so we need to continue to add new energy molecules to the mix. And so, you know, I I you know, in our in our mind, 2023 is set up to be a watershed year for Jericho with all of the good things we have in the hopper right now. Mm -hmm. So we are pushing forward to continue our efforts to decarbonize the thermal marketplace. Mm -hmm. So coming to, to separate a little bit, so mm -hmm. um, coming to the oil and gas business uh, first, uh, then one of the last, pre or it was the last press releases, you're coming up uh, with a, a strong result. Uh, you drilling, and we spoke a little bit before, you drilling only um, um, vertical uh, wells, not horizontal wells. So the costs are much, much more uh, efficient. And the decline curve normally is in, in a, a vertical hole uh, uh, less than a horizontal well. A horizontal well has a really a whole, uh, a high decline rate um, and uh, or decline curve, I must say. And and um, uh, uh, a vertical hole is uh, normal. You have a decline for sure. That's it's natural. That uh, is in the oil and, and gas business. Um, but also, I read when I look at uh, a little bit that you start um, that that, that uh, or you be with beginning at the middle of the year you start and you drill new wells. So you're coming up with with this one. Do you plan other wells? Uh, other wells coming on online. Um, and, and what is the idea for 23 for the whole oil and gas business, what we can expect? So, you know, it was 2022 was a nice year. After 96 months of relatively low oil prices, it was a real breath of fresh air to have um, a little bit of wind at our back from an oil price perspective. And so, you know, we are very conservative when it comes to the development of our oil and gas assets. We are focused on what I think of as infrastructure-led development. So we don't take um, infrastructure risk where we drill holes in the middle of nowhere where we have no infrastructure to connect them to. So everything you'll see from us will be around our existing infrastructure. It'll be 3D seismic defined. So these are very precise targets. And as you alluded to, you know, we will focus on vertical development because we feel like the risk profile of our upstart hydrogen business warrants a conservative approach to the cash flow of oil and gas business. And so our, our vertical wells are significantly less in terms of cost, right? You're looking at wells that are costing you, you know, less than a million dollars typically to drill um, and are going to deliver an EUR that is, you know, north of 100,000 barrels. So you're looking at IRRs that are significant, you know, high, you know, 75 plus percent type of IRR results. So from our perspective, we have a, a forward-looking approach that will continue to drill these wells out of cash flow. Um, this is on acres that we've already we already own and that we lease, um, and we have quite a few of them in inventory that we will continue to develop. The biggest challenge around drilling, whether it's vertical or horizontal, is access to services and equipment. Um, the delay in bringing the well online had nothing to do with the team; it had to do with access to services, mm -hmm. um, just being able to get. Um, the folks we needed to complete the well on site to do it. So we've taken some measures to expedite that a little bit more efficiently in 2023. Um, but the access to services is a challenge. Um, people are just 
not have not come back to the oil and gas service business um, post pandemic. And so that has slowed, you know, what we'd like to see. So what you'll see from us is probably a few wells coming online together where we'll drill multiple locations and then complete multiple locations so that we're not, you know, always dependent on the completion crew or frac crew to bring a well online. Mm -hmm. um, but these are not deep wells. These are sub 5,000 feet, you know, vertical wells, but really nice reservoir, very defined, multiple pay zones, and, and as you alluded to, you know, typically speaking, very slow decline. So, you know, the first one we announced, um, that's been on for uh, give or take 50 days now, 60 days in terms of full production. And the other thing we are doing that slows the announcements is that we're testing the zones, right? So because there are multiple development zones, we want to know what each zone is capable of producing. So we understand how best to bring it online. Um, and what the infrastructure needs are going to be of that well. And so with the last one, which we just brought online, we tested two different production zones and then ultimately ended up commingling them after letting each one run for about 30 days on its own. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's been a real nice um, event for us as it's sort of done over 70 barrels, close to 75 barrels a day now since we brought it online. It's a real nice piece of um, development work by our oil and gas team. So kudos to them. And now they have the next one drill, the, um, and we'll drill the third one, and then we'll frack those two together so we can bring them on together. And you'll continue to see that from that side of our business. And you know, look, we have a very strong opinion that oil prices will stay um, fairly healthy for the balance of 2023. Uh, quite surprised how much gas prices have declined. Um, gas does not make up uh, a large part of portion of our production mix, but you know, surprised to watch gas go from just about six dollars in mm in MCF to to now I don't know two seventy five here in the U S. Which unbelievable to see it decline that much. But the reality is, I mean, our assets are oil focused, so you know, we're kind of more concentrated on the oil side of that business. So you know, pretty excited about that development effort and what we're doing there, and you know, look forward to doing more of that. And we will be active in looking at acquisition opportunities. I mean, we will look to add oil and gas producing assets to our base. The market is still very buyer friendly. Um, you know, assets are still trading at a fairly substantial discount. And, you know, a lot of that has to do with capital flows. I mean, capital flows in Europe, Canada, the US have continued to flow out of oil and gas and into other energy sources. Um, yeah. Even with a healthy oil price, the money's still moving out of there. Yeah, it's, uh, you see it on the valuation what the most companies have. And you yeah. see a lot of, of M&A deals smaller ones smaller companies buying portion from bigger companies then the divest then they want to go green and mm -hmm. but we need oil and uh, that's the oil price uh, the gas price in in us uh, surprised me also a little bit then um uh, the us uh, sell a lot of uh, their gas uh, to to europe uh, over the next 10 years so yeah. to really higher higher prices so uh, that the gas price should be stable so or, or it's going up like a little bit but i was also surprised and every company produce also when it's oil focus also gas it's it's natural it comes with sure. uh, so but the, from the technical side this is the oil and gas business i must say i'm a pro of oil and gas i believe really on a higher price you see it this with all this surrounding noise uh, from recession not recession the oil price stay on really high level so that's mean if we coming in a growth mode uh, that the oil price we're going up closely to 100 bucks i think in the in the in the new new future so yeah. um but this is the old business then mm -hmm. maybe went in, out in the uh, next 30, 40 years. But the new business, the hydrogen business and, and this, uh, all this what's going going green business, I must say, uh, is, is very interesting and really, really hot. So, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's been, you know, so it's interesting for us because I think that having all the experience we do and now marrying it with our material science team of chemical engineers, mechanical engineers, electrical engineers, um, you bring a perspective to evaluating the new energy business that's different than software or just pure tech because you have an understanding, we have an understanding of what it takes to bring energy to the customer, right? Because energy isn't the same from a commercialization as software or any other tech, but right? you have to actually produce it, you have to distribute it, you have to package it, you have to deliver it, and it has to be consumed. 
You know, so there's a different world that comes with that. And I think with hydrogen, what we've come to see is, is that really the only viable path forward in the current infrastructure world is distributed generation, sort of on-site um, production of hydrogen, marrying it with green assets or green um, power purchase agreements, um, electrolyze it right on site and produce the hydrogen for the boiler or whatever the use case may be at the client site. But we are not short of folks interested in decarbonizing their thermal load. And, you know, you brought up Brulatic. Well, Brulatic was just one brewery or one distillery, excuse me. We, we now have, I'm going to say 10, could be a little less, a little more, I forget exactly the number, of engineering studies with different distilleries that um, are looking to decarbonize. And we just did a great video with one group out of, out of Tennessee, um, all about their use of steam, all about the importance of it in their distilling process and the need to sort of go for this farm to table clean um, product. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, so food and beverage has been, you know, fast moving and, and very interested in decarbonizing all they do for their customers. So pretty excited to see that. Yeah, but this is that the pressure comes from the customer. Uh, you mm -hmm. see that the, 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 the pressure comes from the customer, the companies take it and say, okay, we must do something that we can go green. Uh, and, and now uh, they're they are looking for technologies, um, how right. they can put the ta uh, tag on it. Yeah, we are green energy or we are we are support them or we are green or whatever uh, to market this. Um, um, and, and this is very interesting. So you you talk with other distilleries like Bruchladik mm -hmm. uh, to 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 use the same technique. So but Bruchladik is, is a very good example. I think it was the first uh, company that they, they used this. So but I hear not too much from them. How did it run there? So Bruchladik is taking longer than we would have liked to take. Um, the project is slightly slower than we would have liked. Um, some of that has to do with the government piece of it. Some of it has to do with just sort of the site. Um, But with all of these things, each implementation is roughly a 24-month implementation. Um, not anything to do with us. It's more a function of getting the power to the location, getting the site permitted, getting the safety, getting the airport. You'd be, inter you'd be amazed at how little rules and regs exist around the use of hydrogen on site. So you're almost in each instance, what we've learned in a local location perspective is, you have a lot of things that you have to overcome to get it done because they've never used hydrogen in, in, in most of these jurisdictions. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I was just with the developer yesterday um, sort of for the next phase of that. So it, it's coming. They just take longer than we'd like, Joe. Mm -hmm. Isn't it not hydrogen? I, I think always hydrogen is similar to natural gas. Is it so much different to that? It, it is, yes, because the way that – so first off, the island doesn't have any gas. Okay. Okay. So okay. it's diesel. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But but um, on the uh, from the regulation stuff, I think uh, the regulated people know or from the regulator they know net natural gas. Um, and, they do. And, uh, hydrogen. Okay. I, I think hydrogen has a higher energy per per. It does. Uh, uh, I don't know. So it's a higher <laughs> energy molecule and it's a smaller molecule. So. Storage is different for, for hydrogen. You're going to have, so with natural gas, you have a pipeline system. There's very little on-site storage. Mm -hmm. um, with hydrogen, in most cases, you're going to have some level of on-site storage. And so that's a permitting process in and of itself. Mm -hmm. um, what that storage looks like, where you site it, um, how you, how, how you um, build around it, what, what are the facilities near it, and how do you pipe it in. Those are things that are just new for most jurisdictions. Mm -hmm. Okay, but what we can expect from this hydrogen business in 2023? So we are focused, very focused on selling eight boilers to a quarter in 2023. That's our goal. Um, you know, so we hope to book eight orders. Um, installations, we're hoping to have two installed in Q4 um, and then two every quarter thereafter because it takes, the supply chain is better but it's not perfect. Um, and so we are actively looking at manufacturing as close to our customers as we can. Um, so we have our UK manufacturer currently, but we are actively looking for manufacturing partners in Europe, manufacturing partners in the US and manufacturing partners in Canada. Um, because shipping our boiler is 
not a cost effective um, solution. So what we want to do is make our proprietary parts as close to home as we can and the balance of the boiler as close to the customer as we can. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, pretty exciting. So our European business has actually been also a great start because, uh, you know, at the tail end of last year, we signed a marketing deal with Exigen, um, just a fantastic group of um, clean energy guys that are um, bringing our boiler out to the EU market. Um, mm-hmm. And they've really hit the ground running in Italy, which has been awesome from a hydrogen perspective. You know, they have the Olympics now. They're talking about it all hydrogen. Um, so Italy is a, it has been a great um, new find for us in terms of having a team there. And, you know, they're on the ground. So they're, they're there doing everything we need to do to sell more boilers in Europe faster. Mm-hmm. Um, and so pretty exciting for us. And I would say this, the grants we're seeing coming out from Italy, from Germany, from, from, from France, um, they're pretty significant to bring the cost of hydrogen to parity with natural gas. Mm-hmm. to force people, you know, the carrot right now, everybody's offering the carrot, right? Do this. Now we're going to give you the incentive to do it, but soon what you're going to see is the stick where emissions are getting cut and we're seeing it in the States. I mean, California, you can no longer install, um, heating steam based equipment that is run on, on any fossil fuels. Mm-hmm. So all new builds there have to have non fossil fuel based energy systems. Um, and you're seeing those regs permeate um, different marketplaces. Mm-hmm. You know, and I think that's going to, you know, you're going to force people to think in a, in a lower carbon way. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's coming. Everything takes time, but it's coming. Mm. So that's mean we can expect uh, our order flow uh, and mm-hmm. but uh, installation starting uh, from, from... Q4 is our target. Yeah. I mean, getting this. So I would say that what we've come to realize is getting the site ready is a heavier lift than we appreciate it because, you know, we had always assumed that with all the industrial gases floating out there that the regs were in place. But what we're finding is, you know, regs aren't as tight and regs aren't as focused on hydrogen and oxygen storage. And so having to sort of do the heavy lift on the ground, it just takes time. Um, it's a process. Okay. Uh, one last question to the hydrogen business. When you come, uh, when orders come in, Uh, and and it takes then six months, nine months uh, to for the production uh, and so on. Who financed this portion? Is there contracts at the th- uh, that you get the upfront payment or or whatever? Then that sounds for me that uh, you need a, a lot of capital to 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 build the uh, the inventory that you can sell then after. Um, so how it works? So you, you, your assumption is correct. Um, we typically have the raw materials purchased up front or the long lead items. So the customers, we don't, we don't um, build them in mass yet. We build them per spec. And so each order will be a customer paying for the, um, the, the, the raw materials up front. But the longer term solution there is going to be, remember, it's a boiler. It's mm-hmm. a piece of industrial equipment. So we are talking to different um, financial institutions about um, financing customer purchases and leasing options for their boilers. Mm-hmm. Okay. So I think, I think after, um, you know, I don't know, I don't know if it's five, if it's 10, but at some point I think financing options will be readily available mm-hmm. for the customers. But generally speaking, it's a, it's typical for customers to put um, a third of the price up front to buy okay. the raw materials in order. And the supply chain problem has forced that in some respects because you're unable to hold steel prices and things like that. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, that's it. That, that's my thinking. When when you have a, you have a great order uh, flow or growth uh, inflow, and and and, and you, you sell this like uh, crazy, but then the in the back end, then you need a lot of money to to uh, to support these orders to. And, and, yeah. and finish this order so and, and and so and for a small company it makes uh, this this tougher it does. yeah we want to be the technology company joe we don't want to be you know that's why we are seeking manufacturing partners that we think are going to allow us to deliver faster mm-hmm. bring bring integration into it so that we can deliver the sauce the secret sauce which is our technology they can do what they're good at which is making them in country 
within the code and the specs of the given region so that the customer deployments go faster and faster and mm -hmm. faster. And also then you have a bigger, bigger partner or a great partner there that you have at the local, you have a different support uh, and so on and so on. That's total that's right. different. That's, that's exactly right, Jeff. Yeah. That's exactly right. Uh, Brian, uh, thank you for, for the update. We, we, we can t talk, I think, for the next half an hour, but we have still 25 minutes on, on the uh, uh, talk so far. Super. So uh, thank you for the introduction, uh, not introduction, for the new information from, from the update. Um, good luck with your drilling on the oil side and good luck thank also you. on the other uh, side with uh, the order inflow and uh, the execution then is, is uh, hopefully... Uh, not really so painful. I know exactly bureaucrats uh, can be do a good job. <laughs> we are from Europe. We are world championship. Uh, we, we win every year the world championship in bureaucrats. Um, so uh, we know exactly what this can be. So thank you for your time. Um, Thanks, Joe. Thank you. Appreciate it. Uh, ja, das war jetzt ein Update von Jericho, uh, wirklich spannend. Company besteht aus zwei Teile, Öl und Gas und das andere ist Wasserstoff. Öl und Gas ist, uh, 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 haben sie jetzt letztes Jahr wieder beschlossen, Bohrungen zu machen, uh, haben jetzt auch eine Bohrung erst vor kurzem wieder veröffentlicht, 75 Bärs, die sind nur uh, keine horizontale Bohrlöcher, sondern nur vertikale Bohrlöcher, die sind viel stabiler, die Kleingrade ist niedriger und natürlich die Kosten sind viel geringer. Sie Suchen auch noch Opportunities, weil sie sagen, der Bereich ist depressiv. Es ist nur ein Bayermarkt, also so kann sie was billig aufkaufen, weil die Großen eigentlich die Westen. Und für Jana ist das jetzt einfach ein Markt, wo sie Cashflow produzieren, damit sie Hydrogen-Business, also ein Wasserstoff-Business, supporten können und finanzieren können. Und interessant ist es, wir haben vor zwei Jahren geredet, da war die Destillerie Bruchladig. Das ist dieser große Whisky-Produzent in, in, in Schottland oben. Und er sagt halt, die, bei der Umsetzung, sie sind noch immer in der Umsetzung drin, es dauert alles länger als erwartet, weil nämlich eben auch einerseits Supply Chain Issues, aber auch die ganzen Kleinigkeiten, was mit Wasserstoff zusammenhängt. Die ganzen Gesetzgebungen kennen sie mit Wasserstoff zu wenig aus. Das heißt, das muss dann alles überprüft werden und wieder überprüft werden und wieder danach. Und also das klingt nach einem ziemlich taffen Job. Das ist in einer Anfangsphase, wenn sich ein Markt neu entsteht, aber auch normal. Keiner will einen Fehler machen. Wasserstoff ist ja doch auch ein sehr brennbares Produkt. Es brennt wie die Hölle und von daher will natürlich keiner Fehler machen. Und sehr spannend, wirklich interessant und Sie erwarten heuer einen schönen Orderflow und Delivery von diesen neuen Boilers soll im, im, im vierten Quartal starten. Sie haben er hat irgendwie so 10 oder 11 Destillerien, sprechen sie schon auch. Es geht vor allem um Dampfentwicklung, äh, äh, also so auch bei Prochladik. Das heißt, sie machen einen Verdampfer, der aber nicht auf Öl oder Gas basier, äh, basiert, sondern auf Wasserstoff und dadurch viel grüner ist. Und es geht dann um die Wasserstoffproduktion auch noch, also die ganze ähm, äh, Lieferkette, dass sie abschließen. Also wirklich spannend, es tut sich da was. Die Company ist auch nicht neu, das ist, ist, ist nicht ist eine, die jetzt irgendwie auf den Zug aufspringt, sondern die sind seit Jahren schon da ähm, und, und dürften wirklich interessante Deals auch gemacht haben, wenn man sich die Webseiten anschaut, die ist voll mit irgendwelchen äh, Agreements, Deals und das könnte extrem spannend werden. Also schauen wir da mal nur durch, was da, da wirklich viele Deals gemacht haben. Extrem spannend. Und der Aktienkurs, der passt eigentlich überhaupt nicht dazu, für das, dass man einerseits im, passt vielleicht fürs Gasbusiness, sage ich mal, ein Ölbusiness, aber nicht für Wasserstoff. Also eigentlich gegenteilige Entwicklung. Spannend. Ähm, ich werde mir möglicherweise jetzt da ein paar Stücke reinlegen. Weiß ich noch nicht. Äh, werde ich dann erst in meinem nächsten äh, SI auch nochmal äh, kommentieren. Aber finde ich extrem spannend. Ja, das war ein Interview mit äh, Jericho Energy. Wir haben heute den Donnerstag, 2. Februar. Und uh, yeah, I will auch uh, no more update more. Brian, thank you for your time. Uh, one last question. Uh, what is the shareholder structure at the moment? Well, how many shares are outstanding? So we have about 225 million shares outstanding, Joe. Okay. Um, It's uh, roughly 60, 60, 70 million, 80 million or, or uh, market cap. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's, it's almost 80 million market cap Canadian. So, I mean, it's, yeah, you know, okay. that's about where we are. But, I mean, obviously, we think we're worth a lot more than that. But you know, hopefully, <laughs> yeah, we'll no, find our way up. I said in my German introduction that it surprised me 
the, the share price. It looks like more as an oil company. Yes, an oil company, you have to decline. Uh, everybody wants out of oil. Uh, they make normally a big profit at the moment, but but it's not looking for a hydrogen company. And, and still for oil company, when you look at the two year, uh, two year chart, uh, it's it's uh, becoming down from 120 now to 30, 30 plus ah. a little bit. That's, that's really, really, um, but as an investor, as I must say, when I should buy, when the stock is up or when the stock is down. So um, maybe we have now a great opportunity here. Buy low, sell high, right? That's uh, that's always what I try. <laughs> harder to, it's harder to do than it is to say. But yeah, yeah that's right. That's right. OK, Thanks, Brian, thank you for Take your care. time and uh, good luck. And hopefully we have time to do an interview again. Yeah, no, I appreciate it. Thanks, Joe. Perfect. Thank you.